I have a confession to make. I'm not fun to watch movies with. I'm, I'm really not. I have a very high standard when it comes to watching movies, and literally any movie that my wife picks, I always think is not good enough, and I'm always very surprised when she does manage to find what I would consider a good movie. I like complex movies. I like movies that are that require you to study a lot about them, to think about the different symbols and, and the different stories and themes that go along into it. Sometimes I like to see stuff blow up and I like to see superheroes punch supervillains. But even then, I take those movies and I warp them and twist them and change them and I look for symbolism and all this stuff. It's kind of boring, actually, and I blame it on the fact that I was an English major. You see, as an English major, what they teach you and what they tell you to do is to read into the text, which is wonderful. It's great to have all of these great thoughts and these ideas, and you say, oh, the author said that the room was blue. This means that the author was depressed, or he is trying to show something along the lines of sadness or mourning when talking about this room. And nine times out of ten, do you know what the author means? when he says that the room is blue? He means the room is blue. That's it. Now, understand that I have, a, a, my, my best friend is also uh, an English major turned into a pastor. Actual conversations we have at times are not necessarily about the merits of infant baptism or doctrines of grace, but we will sit down with one another and dissect Star Wars. We will discuss the themes, how the saga is like poetry, how it loops back on itself, how there are issues of loss and all of these wonderful things. Now please keep in mind, we don't do this to be boring, but we are literally overanalyzing a movie about magic space wizards. And that's fine. It's sometimes fun to do those things. But it can lead you to this place where you look at something and you automatically put yourself into it in some way. You see, you're trying to figure out the meaning of something that means to you. A long time ago, there was this wonderful art movement called Dadaism, which was inherently art with no meaning. You would see something like a vacuum cleaner with handcuffs on it. And you would be possibly struck by it because it, it shows the oppression that machines have or, or the roles that people have in society. And you would put all of these things into this artwork. And the artist would say, no, it's literally a vacuum cleaner with a pair of handcuffs on it. The goal of Dadaism was to elicit some sort of an emotional response from the person who saw the art. And when that happens, you can't help but put a bit of yourself into that. If you're feeling bogged down by doing chores and cleaning, of course you would read something along that. If you feel oppressed by the fact that you're a woman and society says you have to cook and you have to clean, of course you will see that when you look at this art. Because the point of it was to put yourself into it and to draw something out of it. Sometimes that's all well and good. But the problem is sometimes we overanalyze things. Sometimes we try to find meaning when the meaning is blatant and simple. I find this happens a lot in churches today. When we look at Christianity, when we look at what our church is, not this specific church, but the church universal, we try to figure out where we fit into it. We try to figure out how the scriptures speak to us personally. And of course, there are times when scriptures speak personally to us. Of course, there are times when God speaks personally to us through the scriptures. But have you noticed what we do? How we take scripture, how we twist it, how we conform it to what we want to get out of it. How we look at things and twist them and tweak them and change them so we can make the Bible say whatever we want. If you don't think we can do that, I challenge you to remember what happened in the church during the Civil War. 
The Bible was used as a tool to keep slavery going. In Germany during World War II, the Bible was used to show that the Jews were less than human and they deserved everything that they got. A simple reading of the text can take it and twist it. And one of the things that bugs me, one of the things that really grinds my gears is that we do this with Jesus. All the time we look at Jesus and we have these notions of Jesus. We have these ideas of Jesus. We all have a picture of Jesus in our mind. Some blonde-haired white guy who kind of looks like Gandalf and Ted Nugent. That's typically what we think of when we think of Jesus. We don't think of Jesus as being a little short. Maybe he didn't have long flowing hair. Maybe his beard wasn't crazy long. We don't ever think about that. Everything that we know about uh, medieval art and literature, everyone knows The Last Supper, the painting by Leonardo da Vinci. One of the biggest critiques you'll find of it is why is everyone sitting on the far side of the table? And that's not the problem with the painting. Again, it's a wonderful painting. It spawned a whole bunch of crazy conspiracy theory books, but that's fine. But what you really have to notice is that not one of those persons is wearing clothes that are representative of the time they would have been in. You see, when Leonardo da Vinci painted the Last Supper, he put them all in modern clothes of the time crafting and creating a scene that he would be familiar with. Because again, when you create something, it's hard to not put yourself in it. And that's what we do with Jesus today. We have all of these different notions of Jesus, this big, strong, triumphant boxer type person who comes in bashing heads and kicking skulls and taking no names and just being crazy awesome and powerful. Then we have lovey-dovey hippie Jesus who walks around in sandals and maybe has a flower crown on his head and says, hey man, it's cool, just love everybody, and it's all good. We have strict authoritarian Jesus who says, thou must adhere to these rules and these rules alone or thine will be cast into the fires of hell. We have all of these Jesuses that we make so we create one that's just right for us. This Jesus tells us what we want to hear. This Jesus tells the world what we want them to hear. We create our own little personal Jesus to suit our needs, to suit our wants, to suit our desires. And we ignore all of what Jesus is. See, sometimes people will ask me, they'll say, Sam, what would Jesus do? And I've talked about that. It's, it's a good question. And sometimes when I'm feeling typic, um, especially sarcastic and cheeky, I'll say, well, flipping over tables and driving people out with whips is always an option. Because that's something Jesus did. So that could literally be an answer to the question, what would Jesus do? But we like our Jesus to be like us to like the things we like, to hate the things we hate. And it's problematic. When you look at the text today, it's Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. And they call it the Sermon on the Plain. Now, we're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. We've seen wonderful pictures of the Sermon on the Mount. And this starts out the same way with a di little bit different version of the Beatitudes but it's called something different. You know why it was called something different? Because of where the person Luke talked to was standing when they heard it. You see, Matthew's getting his account while he's up on the mount with Jesus. Everyone else that Luke is talking to, he's, he's talking to people who listened to it and saw it from a different perspective. Same story, different perspective. So which one's right? Well, the answer is yes. They're both right. And this Jesus that talks is not exactly saying things that necessarily would be great and powerful and popular. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And we say, hold on a minute, Jesus. 
We have got pastors and preachers on TV that are saying if you're wealthy, if you're doing uh, well financially, if you've got good stocks and bonds and all that stuff, if you got a new car every single year, if you're doing well financially, that means you're doing good and God loves you and he's giving you these things. And yet you're trying to tell me, Jesus, that the poor people, those who have nothing, they will inherit the kingdom of God? But that's something we hear isn't it? We hear that God will bless you, that God is Santa Claus, that God will just throw all this stuff at you. Because we've created a Jesus of personal wealth. He looks at his disciples and say, blessed are you who are hungry, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what the ancestors did to the prophets. Ain't nobody want to hear that. When you're going through something, when you're being torn down, when you're being belittled, when you're being beaten for your beliefs, nobody wants to hear, oh, it's a good thing. We want happy Jesus. We want happy, fun, sunshine Jesus that tells us everything's going to be okay, that we shall overcome. Did you notice in this that there is no overcoming for this? There is not one moment where Jesus says, you are blessed for this and you will overcome it. We've created a victory, Jesus. When we don't recognize that suffering and pain are actually kind of integral to what it means to be a Christian. Sometimes you have to follow God no matter where that leads. And that's hard. Sometimes you have to do that which is necessary. And that's hard. When I was in seminary, it was during the summer. I was taking Hebrew. I was very ecstatic about it because taking Hebrew and Greek were two of the things that scared me the most about going to seminary. Taking it rapid fire in the middle of the summer meant I had literally nothing else to do but to study Greek and Hebrew so I could focus all of my attention on that and hopefully pass. And then, during Hebrew, my teeth hurt. See, I had enough room for my wisdom teeth to be in. I didn't have enough room to properly take care of them. So they were starting to crack, and the dentist said they need to come out. Well, crud. That was my reaction. I didn't really have any cavities. I'd never really had major dental work that needed to be done, and now they were talking about extracting my teeth. So I said, okay, that's fine. If I have to get them taken out, I will get them taken out. Put me to sleep. Knock me right out, because I am not looking forward to this. The doctor told me, oh, we can do that. That's no problem if you're nervous. But your insurance won't cover it. And it'll be over $300 for the anesthesia alone. I thought for a minute, and before I could say anything, my loving wife piped in and said, just give him the Novocaine, he'll be fine. When I was a child, I got stung by a bee in my mouth. A bee flew into a can of pop. I didn't see it. I take a drink. All of a sudden, I'm getting stung on my cheek. It was very horrifying, very troubling experience for me. I've never had good luck with the insect kingdom. And this was one of the things that happened to me. So I was not looking forward to getting a Novocaine shot in my mouth. They did it though. And I did it because, well, I was a poor seminary student. So I did what I had to do. I didn't even want the teeth to come out. If they could have stayed in, that would have been great. Instead, what they did is they shoot me full of Novocaine and they start yanking and pulling and tugging on my teeth. Now I know I had to get them out. I wasn't a fan of it, but I did what I had to do in order to keep things how they should be. That's what God calls each and every one of us to do. 
It's great to know that there's victory in Jesus. That's one of the best hymns around, victory in Jesus, because there is victory in Jesus. But the problem is the victory in Jesus almost always looks completely different than what we want the victory to be. My dad would always say growing up, man, why wasn't I born rich instead of so darn good looking? It was his way to have a nice chuckle. And then I, I look back on it and I'm like, Dad, you were rich. I mean, you didn't drive Ferraris or anything, but you had two kids, you owned a home, you had a stable job where you could literally pick any vacation time you wanted because of your seniority. You've done all these things. You just are measuring by someone else's yardstick. And sometimes we need a reality check, don't we? Sometimes we really need to look at the words of Jesus and to see what Jesus says and to see what Jesus wants us to do. So it's hard for us to grapple with these words, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the hungry, because we don't want to do that. We want to be number one. We want to be the best. We want bigger and better and more money and all this stuff. And that's not what God is calling us to do at all. God is calling us to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, no matter what. Look at as Jesus continues. Woe to you who are rich, for you received your, consola your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets." Completely taking and reversing the blessings that he gave earlier. It's easy to think that when things are going well, that means everything's wonderful and God's happy. Because that's what we're told. That's the Jesus we've created. That we need to put ourselves first. That Jesus wants us to do all of these things. That Jesus wants us rich, wants us to be happy and to have all of these things, when you look at the words of Jesus, what it really says is seek me and my kingdom first and all of these things will be given to you. Not necessarily what we want, but what we need. And that's the problem. We think we know better than God. And as we're reading the text, since we know so much more than God, since we know exactly what we need in this life, we start to make a Jesus who feeds us what we want, what we need. We don't come to church to build ourselves up and make ourselves feel better. We come to worship, to hear the word of God, and to have our lives transformed and changed. As I stated earlier, I believe my wife has a, just a horrible taste in movies sometimes. I, I try really hard to give her the benefit of the doubt when it comes to movies. I really do. And I know that she despises and loathes the movies that I like. But... I'll sit through the stupid romantic comedies with her because I know eventually she'll sit through a Star Wars movie with me. Just, I'm not allowed to watch Lord of the Rings anymore. Personal reasons I'll tell you all about later. I enjoy those movies. You've got magic, you've got orcs, you've got all of these things. But Gladrielle, my wife, is very adamant that she does not want to watch them. I get that. I respect that. Because people get changed when they're around people that they love. People do things differently. People start to change their behavior in little, little ways, bit by bit. And so eventually there may come a time where I enjoy an inane, stupid, romantic comedy. It's possible. It's also possible communism will start working well. But our goal as Christians is not to fill ourselves. And when we look at the words of Jesus, when we look at the words of Christ, our goal is not to fill ourselves, but to be empowered to go out into the world and to do as God calls us to do. 
to be with those who weep, to be with those who are sad, to be with those who have lost things, and to show them, to show this world, to really make a difference in this world, to show them and teach them that there is a God who loves them, a God who wants to be with them, a God who desperately, desperately wants to be with this world. It ain't always flashy. You probably won't make a bunch of money from it. But that's what the real, authentic Jesus calls us to do. Thanks be to the God who loves us and guides us, especially when we take him at his own word. Amen.